Welcome to the podcast service of Sydney's FM 103.2, available on the web at fm1032.com.au. Some may have heard before the famous story of those young lads who hopped on a bus in the US in the mid-1930s, and they tried to pick a fight with the man sitting up the back of the bus by himself. These lads began with a few insults. The stranger didn't respond. They sat closer to the man and turned up the heat of the insults, and still he said nothing. A few minutes passed before they arrived at the man's stop. He stood up, and he was much bigger than they had estimated. He looked down at the young men, reached into his pocket, and handed them his business card. He turned and quietly hopped off the bus and walked on his way. The lads huddled around the card, eager to learn the name of this gentle giant. And they read the words, Joe Lewis, Professional Boxer. Now, for those of you who don't know your boxing history, it turns out these young men had just tried to start a fight with the man who had become the heavyweight boxing champion of the world from 1937 to 1949, one of the most successful boxers of all time. Their assumptions about the stranger were all wrong. The business card, not to mention the events of the next few years, proved just how wrong they were. This reportedly true story illustrates a common occurrence in the modern approach to the subject I want to talk about over the next few weeks, the subject of Jesus. Either through misinformation, wishful thinking, or prejudice, and sometimes a combination of all three, the Jesus of public imagination is often very different from the figure we find in our earliest sources. Our assumptions prove misleading. Now, when I say public imagination, I'm including here the imagination of the Christian church, Although I speak as a committed Christian, I am frequently struck by the difference between the Christ preached in some contemporary sermons and the man who emerges from the pages of history. Indeed, somewhere deep inside my computer's hard drive are plenty of sermons I've preached in the past, but for reasons that I think will become clear over the next few weeks, I don't reckon I could deliver any longer with the same sincerity. Equally questionable are some of the assumed Jesuses in popular discourse. The Dan Brown novel, The Da Vinci Code, offers one obvious example. Here, fictional experts effortlessly strip back the ecclesiastically conspired son of God to apparently reveal the true man who was a simple, wise teacher and who settled down with his wife and kids and whose descendants can now be found living happily ever after in modern France. Now, Brown's Jesus is admittedly a pretty soft target, and I'm going to say a lot more about that uh, later in this series. But other imaginary Jesuses carry an air of plausibility. Take Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ, that amazing film a few years ago, complete with dialogue in Aramaic and Latin, the languages of Jesus and the Romans, respectively. Now, I've got to admit, I was deeply moved by this film. I found it very realistic. Those who criticise Gibson for exaggerating the sufferings of Jesus need to remember that scourging and crucifixion were intentionally horrifying modes of punishment in the ancient Roman world. Nevertheless, the Jesus that emerged from Gibson's portrayal was, despite the veneer of realism, a pretty one-dimensional figure. He was this mere sacrificial lamb on its way to the slaughter. Now, there's a truth here, of course, as any first-year theology student will tell you, but it's a truth devoid of historical context and detached from the extraordinary life that preceded this suffering and gives it its proper meaning. My atheist friend had a point when he said that without an appreciation of what Jesus said and did, Watching the poor guy get beaten to a pulp for two hours was anything but spiritually enlightening. 
Some of the academic images of Jesus are equally open to criticism. Listeners may be surprised to learn that scholarly books and articles on the historical Jesus number in the tens of thousands. Fair dinkum. This vast industry has emerged in the last 30 years dedicated to uncovering the real Jesus, as opposed, it is thought, to the Christ of the Church. Typically, though, the only studies to attract public attention are the sensational ones, those that contradict mainstream perspectives on Jesus. These studies hit the headlines, they make their way into BBC documentaries, and the viewing public is left completely perplexed and completely unaware that most of the best scholarship never reaches them. Now, I've explored this in detail in one of my books called The Christ Files, but it's worth saying a little about it here. It's a sad fact of scholarship in many academic circles that the most impressive work is too subtle, too cautious and too sophisticated, in other words, boring, to be considered newsworthy by the regular media outlets. The headline, Jesus Overturned First Century Dining Rules, is hardly going to excite a newspaper editor, even though it's based on the most solid historical data. But the headline, Jesus was gay, as Brisbane's Courier Mail had a few years ago, is going to cause a small media storm, even though it's based on the musings of an astrologer, PhD student and gay activist. This highlights something that I think is well worth knowing about the scholarly game. In any field of academia, especially in New Testament studies, Scholarship tends to fall into three broad camps or three points along a continuum. And I think it's really important to understand this. Somewhere out on the left-hand margin is what you might call sceptical scholarship. Experts here ply their scholarly craft in the service of naysaying and hyper-criticism, hyper-skepticism. They relish offering brand new theories that call into question the results of broader scholarship. On the opposite margin is what you might call apologetic scholarship. Experts here focus mainly on defending traditional Christianity from scepticism. They often take their cue, in fact, from the sceptical scholars. Like sceptical scholars, most Christian apologists do have good credentials, but they tend to bypass the normal process of academic review and publish directly for the public. Between these two margins, the left-hand margin of uh, sceptical scholarship and the right-hand margin of apologetic scholarship, is what you might call mainstream scholarship, or just middle scholarship. This is where the vast majority of professional biblical scholars are to be found. Mainstream scholars rarely hit the headlines or the shelves of your popular bookstores, but they are regularly published in the hundred or so major peer review journals dedicated to this general subject area. On the whole, mainstream scholars are little interested in debunking or defending Christianity. They're neither staunch sceptics nor devout apologists. They just get on with the business of analysing the New Testament and related material in the way historians would treat any other comparable historical source from the period, whether Caesar, Seneca or Tacitus on the Latin side, or Plutarch, Epictetus or Lucian on the Greek side. Now let me hasten to add that I have no delusions about where my current series on Jesus lies along this spectrum of scholarship. Frankly, nowhere. This is not an academic series of lectures, and I don't for a moment want to suggest that what follows over the next couple of weeks is this careful distillation of the current scholarly debate about Jesus. My goals and approach in this series are very different. Nevertheless, in what follows, I intend to keep within the bounds not only of the marginal, but of the mainstream. While I'm personally pretty sympathetic to the aims of apologetic scholars, in this series I've drawn almost nothing from them. Needless to say, I've drawn even less from uh, sceptical scholars. The aim of this series, which I've titled A Spectator's Guide to Jesus, is to provide you with an introduction to the major portraits of Jesus found in the historical sources. Now, I say portraits in the plural because our best information about Jesus points not to a tidy, monolithic Jesus, 
but to a complex, multi-layered, and sometimes even contradictory figure. I mean, how on earth do you hold together the idea that Jesus is both God and servant at the same time? To recall my Joe Lewis story, the business cards of Jesus are many and varied. I want to look at Jesus as the teacher, as the healer, as saviour, as a new temple, as the Christ, and so on and on. Now, some might feel troubled by all of this, thinking that plurality equals incomprehensibility or unreliability. Others take it as an invitation to do a little rearranging for themselves, trying to make Jesus more neat, a little more digestible. Then there are those, and I admit to being one of them, who quite like the idea that after two millennia of spiritual devotion and more than two centuries of modern critical research, we still can't fit the figure of Jesus into a single box. Jesus, it seems, is destined to stretch our imaginations, confront our beliefs, and challenge our lifestyles for many years to come. My Spectator's Guide to Jesus, then, over the next few weeks, will have done its job properly only if you and I both find ourselves disturbed as much as intrigued by the images of Jesus found in the earliest historical sources. Conscious of this evocative dimension of the figure of Jesus, I'm going to try throughout this series to give listeners, whether you believe in Christ or not, an idea of how these portraits of Jesus have influenced church, society, and the individual, both ancient and modern. I want to highlight how, through the ages, believers and unbelievers alike have found themselves confronted or inspired by these particular images of Jesus as a healer, teacher, saviour and so on. While it's true that people have tried to fashion versions of Christ into their own digestible image, it's equally true that the figure of Jesus has exerted an enormous influence over those who have dared to ponder his life and teaching. And I hope to give you a sense of that influence over the coming weeks. We hope you enjoyed this FM 103.2 podcast. To listen to more great audio, visit fm1032.com.au.